Uh, when you walked in, you said we haven't seen each other in a while. I don't, and I guess this is social media. I don't feel that, which is weird, because I have like I hugged you, and I guess I haven't hugged you in years. Years. I mean, literally. Yeah. And you were like, I haven't seen you in a while, and I was like, Yeah, that checks out. I get, but I mean, as much as people bag on social media, I think that's the, there are a lot of things wrong with the way people use it. But I don't feel like I have, like, not seen you, which is weird. And maybe I shouldn't feel as much of that. Uh, and maybe it's because I'm just gone a lot, too, that I don't see anybody. But anyway, I feel like I'm your biggest fan in the whole world. Aww. And I, I was like, oh, it'll be good to see Nicolian today. I didn't realize we hadn't seen each other in years. Well, I feel the same way. I think I, think I feel connected. Maybe that's it. Like, I yeah. feel, I think I, I know enough about you before we have enough history to then to watch your life evolve it's like there's a foundation to be able to just like add to when you just watch somebody but i haven't seen you since you got married i haven't seen you since so many things yeah i think the connection thing is right i also like i root for you so i think inside of whatever this internal feeling and um a machine that does all the thoughts and prayers and roots and like you're in that because I root for you all the time, regardless of what it is. If if it's you have so many you know projects going on, and we'll talk about obviously the record, uh, which is great. I feel like at this point, if I, and I, I'm gonna say this first. I'm gonna say it very sincerely. It really is wonderful. Thank you. It really is wonderful, and we were supposed to do this weeks ago, and I got COVID, and you invited me over to your house whenever you did a first showing and I was somewhere I, we just have never we've just always like been off somewhere mm -hmm. and so it really is wonderful now when I say that I would like to now take a step back and go a lot of people think it's wonderful and you're so good at what you do and I was having a conversation with a couple different people who are really it was one was uh Dan of Dan and Shay one was Carrie Underwood and I was like you guys are so good people don't want to tell you you're like hey good job because you're probably always here all the time and that literally is how what I felt about you before I said that. Now, that being said, they both were like, no, we still like to hear it because we're human beings. But you guys are so good at it. People like me feel ridiculous when we say, hey, good job, because we know that you know you did a good job, even though I know the insecurity of creating something. All, and it's going to come back around in a second. But I was with a friend of mine the other day, um, and we, we'd hung out. And he texted me. He goes, hey, I just listened to... I don't know what it was, something. I, he said, hey, that was really good. And I thought, man, nobody ever tells me that I do good. And I went, oh, my God, this is why I have to tell people they do good <laughs> because I liked it because nobody ever tells me a good job at stuff because I think they just think I hear it. And I don't hear it from anybody because, so anyway, it's really freaking good. And you poured so much of your artistry and yourself into it. And you should be really proud of it. And I know you are, but I just want to say that. It's awesome. Thank you. And it means, uh, it means the world, truly. I, on one hand, it's like um, I, the DMs and the things like that are a bit of a blur. Um, but every time I read one, I'm like, it mean it truly, you're right, it does mean something. And I never really, um, I really never thought that this was going to be that vulnerable of a thing. Because I thought I was just doing it for me. But then when it came time to put it out, everyone was like, this is so brave. And and I see what they mean, um, but it, it is fun to get to get those texts, and I can feel, I can feel the connection with people when they do reach out and say good job. You know, um, what I'm finding though the most is that people are what it's doing more than good job is people want to tell me their story, which to me is the ultimate win in this for me. You know, because I keep saying that word connection today, but it it seems like that's what I'm getting out of it the most. Did you feel? And there are times when I felt this too, but that you were being, and people say brave, that's always a weird thing, but vulnerable. You're being vulnerable in your project that you thought, all right, I'm being vulnerable here. People are going to hear it. Maybe they feel a certain way about me after they hear it. And maybe they feel differently about me. And I'm going to be vulnerable and we'll see how it turns out. But then in reality, it was just people going, no, I'm like you. Yeah. More, than, more than you expected. A hundred percent. And I think where I feel that the most is how specific I was. In, in like a song like Winner, I was like, no one else is going to really care about this, but I'm going to be so proud of it that I'm, I'm going to, this is where I'm going to go with this record. 
but it's just wild how many people and it's not just it's not the obvious character you know it's like a 50 year old man it's like oh mm. my gosh this made me think of this and i'm like really i thought no one would care about this when i wrote my first book i'd written a lot of stuff in there that i thought people were going to judge me and i was embarrassed not of it but i was embarrassed that people would feel sorry for me and that has always been like my trauma is i got you know I, if it wasn't for charity i wouldn't be here as a kid to eat to do anything and I was so embarrassed of this stuff. And I was like, man, nobody's, everybody's going to think less of me or think differently. And it all, like you're saying, it's exactly what you're saying. People were like, hey, uh, yeah, that, that's me too. Mm -hmm. With always like a six degree difference. So it was always very close, but slightly a little different. But I was like, man, that to me opened up the world of being creatively vulnerable and speaking from me. And you've written so many songs, but they really haven't been from your face or mouth or name. And... You know, that's got to be, I don't want to use the word pressure, but a different weight. You know, whenever you're deciding to record or even what lyrics to, what, what to put in a song with you singing it. Like, was that a factor? It actually was easier because I knew what I hadn't been able to say all these years because I was having to compromise. That's interesting. And, and collab, be so collaborative. It felt and, refreshing. Yeah. And um, it didn't feel like pressure. It felt like creative freedom, actually, more than anything. Um, even things like picking when a record comes out or like getting to put songs in a sequence on a track list. Like those are things that people take for granted that songwriters have never gotten to have that freedom and get to be creative in that way. So from the get go, it just felt like, oh, wow, I have so many options. I'm gonna it didn't feel like pressure at all. Brag on you to you a little bit more. Like I, I would see even the imagery and the uh, the pro, we'll say promo pieces that you did to me that were even so much cooler than just. Uh, the standard promo work, but I would see it in the time and effort that you went through to do it. Again, even just as a passion piece, as you would say, what it was in your mind and while you're making it, it was so heads and shoulders above what these, what what everybody else does. Oh. And I just would would look at your promo before I heard anything. Maybe I'd heard a clip of a couple, but even early, and I was like, if you weren't doing the songwriting, if you weren't putting out an art, a record as an artist, like you would totally dominate that space too. Like you have some, some gift of aesthetics. Thank you. I, um, I enjoy it. And I think it's the thing that I don't have um, any pressure around because it isn't ne technically part of my day job. Like I've always loved editing video and editing photos and like long before Instagram, I wanted to have a video blog and so I, I think it's just like an extension of storytelling for me, and I've never fully gotten to do that. Like I start to get to be a part of the beginning of telling a story with a song, and then the artist takes it on, and then they go make it look how they want it to look for them. And I didn't realize how hungry I was for that part of the process until this started. And honestly, that was a part of the process that felt really vulnerable because I, I, think, I think I found a safety in being like a little bit behind the scenes. And I think I had some... I don't know, maybe some messaging early on in my life that was like, don't get too big for your britches, which was like a Midwest, you know, blue collar mentality that I think kept me in that safe space of not really ever stepping out and putting myself out front. So when it came time to go like, oh, you're going to put your photo on the front of this, this record. I was like, no, this is the scary part. Now I have to own that this is about me. Um, in fact, we the original creative concept for all the visuals and aesthetic for the record was for me to do selfie photos in all these different mirrors where you never saw my face. It was just going to be me taking a photo of myself, but then you never saw my face in the mirror because I, again, I was just not quite ready to sit there and show my face and name and be like, this is really about me. But then, then the project just took on a life of its own once I got the creative, the right creative people around it. But now I'm kind of like, I feel like I've opened Pandora's box. I'm like, I want to make more things mm -hmm. like this. So, all right, you're itching to, and I, I definitely want to get to some of this specifically, but you're itching to make more things, but you're also running a label and you're also writing songs and you're also, and I would never be someone to say, you can't do all these things. <laughs> I, I just, I wouldn't. Um, my company at times has said, hey, you're, you're doing too much. You're, uh, you're, uh, you know, you can't focus enough here. And I don't agree with them. And at, time, at, at times they have been right. Mostly not. I've done, a, in my opinion, a really good job of putting the amount of work into the project that needs to have the work. Mm -hmm. 
how do you feel about that same situation happening to you? I think the word that's like I keep going back to is just integrity because this conversation is coming up a lot right now. People are asking me this question and I'm like, I just want to make my time decisions based on integrity. If I've entered into a label deal with someone, I want to handle that with integrity. And when it comes to a point where I'm not doing it that way anymore, then I need to make a change. Um, When I'm not showing up for the things that I've, you know, committed to showing up to and I can't do that anymore. And that includes my family too. Like, um, but I think, I think if you'd asked me a year ago about this record, like what would you do to support it? I would have had a pretty small answer and a safe answer of like, I'm going to put it out and it's going to be precious and it's going to sit there on Spotify and Apple. And, and I'll feel like this was for my, this was more for my legacy and for my like bucket list. And, and then I'll just go right back to work a year later. Now, now that it's been out a few weeks, um, I think I'm a lot more honest with myself about how much energy and time I'm going to put into the record and promoting it because I'm seeing what it's doing to people when they see it or when they hear it. And so I feel like I owe it out of integrity to that project to give it all I've got. Um, and I, and I think all things are connected. What is that? All ships rise or whatever that saying is. A rising I, tide raises all ships. Or, yeah. I, I had to check out halfway with that saying, but yes. I think I, I think you and I are the same in that we're like both and people like this is going to make this stronger and it's all going to, I'm going to learn things through this one process that I can then like, I'm learning so much putting out my own album that, that I can bring back and offer to the label side to be able to look at an artist and say, I've actually done what you're doing and I have empathy and understanding um, and can tell you some more truths based on my experience as being an artist myself that's a unique tool that a lot of other label execs don't have in their toolbox. So that's more how I look at it. I don't look at them as, as they're in competition with each other. I actually look at it as if this could, if this record were to, no matter where it goes, I'm going to bring all the other people along with me. And that's the point of songs and daughters. That's the point of all of it. Now, the other thing I'm learning with age that I'm sure that you have is that you always have the permission to change your mind. And I think as an opportunity, if there were a huge opportunity to come up, I, I'm allowed to say, Hey, I need to take a break from something. I need to pull back from writing for a month or two to do this. Um, and I'm just trying to make those decisions based on what matters when I'm 80 years old. And I look back on this time, am I going to kick myself that I didn't give my record all I had because of 20 to 30 songs that I needed to to write this fall? I don't know. You know, when you mentioned with age, with me, it was, I don't know, seven, eight years ago when I was like, yeah, I think the world, and I don't mean this in a bad way, like it's it's easily manipulated. Not the people, but you can bend it. We're always told it's got to be rigid. This is how the world works. You got to do it this way. No, the more time I spend here, the more I realize completely bendable. All the rules that you know, they're rules because they've been set because other people did them that way. But that doesn't mean you have to do it. And, and most times you're going to be unsuccessful if you go against. But it's the few times that you are very successful that kind of creates a whole new path for everybody else. And so that has been the thing. And, you know, you're, you're it's like preaching to the choir when you say that stuff to me and I say it back to you. Like the world's bendable. You can write and you can be over 30 and start an artist career or you can be, it literally can be done, and because it hasn't been done doesn't mean it won't be done at just a superior level. And I think that even if you decided to quit after this, I think that it's something for people to see and go, all I got to do is create something good. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, that's what it is. Yeah. Just create something good, yeah. and that is your extremely strong base. There are strategic decisions you have to make, but it, but it, but there are so many people that aren't creating something good but then have all the other stuff or they have something mediocre or pretty good. Mm-hmm. And they're like, I can't figure it out. You got, if you can create something good, you can almost go anywhere and do anything with it. No, you're so right. I'm watching that happen right now. Like we've not been, you know how the music business, the whole entertainment world is one big favor. Someone's asking someone for a favor in return for a favor. And it doesn't always look that way to the average consumer, but that's a lot of the economics of our business. And we have not been asking anyone for favors because we just, the goal was to put it out and to make it exist. 
And that was a big enough goal as it was with all the other things I had going on. So then, so now, I guess to your point, it's kind of starting to work on its own, which I think is what you're saying. Like you don't have to scream about something if it speaks for itself. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious right now to see, like even that's just a good word, curious. That's good. I think that's where I am, big picture. It's like I feel satisfied that I did it, and now I'm curious to see what else it's going to do. What do you want it to do? Um, I want it to be heard. I think that's because I feel kind of what I on the back of what I just said. From what I've seen so far, when people hear and see, and when I say see, there's another visual component of the album. There's a visual version of the album that you can hit play that has not been released yet it's coming very soon um that i think when we show people that or they hear the record um it's it um people start telling other people about it and they want to show it to other people and so i just want to i just want people to i want people to have that experience because people are you know, whether it's someone in my family or someone in the music business that's seen the video or heard the record, they start, oh, it, it's, it's doing this human thing that's beyond the music business, which is making people think about their own story and their own life. And that's the heart of storytelling. So be honest with me for a second. Best case scenario in your mind before you put it out. Because best case can be you're playing stadiums and you're like Zach Attack and you're right. I mean, really, that that that's always my best case scenario with anything. Like, I my show is so popular they like me president. Like, that I have the biggest, wildest best case scenarios. I also have the worst, uh, worst case scenarios where I die and somebody shoots me and it's that's like I'm on both sides. But you, as you're making the project, what was best case scenario in your mind? Um. Wow. As I was making it. As big as I would let myself go was just to get it finished because it was a fight. I was like clawing to get it finished. Like why? Because I my schedule it was uh. nothing and there was nothing convenient. There were I had every excuse in the world and every reason in the world and conflict in the world for this to never be finished. It's a lot to write and make a record and and to really be the driving force behind it. I don't technically have I, at the time it was really just me. No one else other than me and my producers knew that I was doing it. No one was pushing it along, giving me a deadline. It was all on me. Um, so that was the goal when I was making it. Now I would say, like, best case scenario, you know. Don't be humble. Like, literally, what's the best I, case like, scenario? Like, win a Grammy. Get nominated for a Grammy. Like, those those kinds of things. Um, I would love I would love for it to be commercially successful enough to be able to um, do it again. You know, and as you know, like, there's a team around this now. I've built a small lean and mean team of pretty young people that are doing a lot of this stuff for the first time. And we're all learning as we go. And I would love for them. I would love to support that infrastructure. So I want it to be successful if for nothing else for that, so that we can keep doing this. Why not put any of your artists on it as a feature? Mm, Cause it wasn't their story. Um, I felt like I was so insular. Just it, it was so many of the ideas and concepts for this were I needed to make it about me. And I know that sounds kind of selfish, but there was a, I was like, that's why I've, it's taken me 20 years to do it was because I was so afraid to make it too much about me. And that's something I think I've evolved. I've grown through a lot of work and self awareness. And wisdom with age to realize that that's that's not um, it's not a bad thing to make it about me. That's what my whole career doing me. I'll be honest with you. I mean, there's a lot of me. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, by doing you right, you can also do for others really right. Yeah, and I do. Yes, um, and I I do trust myself that if this were to grow into something much bigger, that I have enough examples now in my career to look back and say, anytime I've been elevated, I've looked for opportunities to elevate others. And so I trust myself with the power that could potentially come with a project or, or anything in my life getting bigger. Let's go to the first song that you cut. Which one was the first? You Not, not track one. Ooh. So I don't want to go easy and go, let's check out track one. But which one did you record first? And then I want to talk about after it was done. I think we started Sunflower. uh, I think we started um, Sunflower and Deathbed maybe around the same time. 
Okay, they let's... were the first ones to go in and like sing on and put some production on. Let's play Sunflower, Mike. And I say you might feel a little crazy trying to fit in with them daisy. Someday that'll be your superpower. It might take till 21, but you'll find your place in the sunflower. So you wrote that with Jimmy Robbins and Sasha Sloan, who were friends with Sasha and Henry. And she's best. just, she's freaking awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that song is a little brighter than most of Sasha's songs. Mm-hmm. You know, so are you, are you and Sasha friends? How did that write come together? Sasha and I have become songwriting sisters over the last, I'd say, three or four years. Um, I was a super fan first. Um, her, I heard her song Thoughts, having no idea who she was. And I was like, oh, my God, I want everything about this. Um, and then I wrote a few songs with her for her pro- for her records. Um, we wrote a song called House With No Mirrors and Is It Just Me that has Charlie Puth on it. And I How did that one go? Is it just me? No, 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 oh, that's daddy. like, I didn't know you wrote that. That song's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I, I love writing with her, and she's um, she's just so good. She's like this hidden gem in Nashville. Nobody knows. She's like a hidden resource almost. But I wrote a lot with her, and I think the thing she has the most songs on this record, and it's because the more, the more I wanted to get human and real, and maybe daring with an idea, she was the one that I felt safest to to try that with, because um, she's one of those yes people that's like, yeah, we could write anything, and she's kind of, I think our journeys to becoming artists were similar, and that we love writing with other people, but there were a lot of things that we wanted. I think she would say this too there were topics that she wanted to write about for herself that there were, there weren't other artists that she got to write about that with. And so that's how she became Sasha Sloan. That's kind of how I became firstborn. Mm-hmm. Um, was just like, I want to write a song about being tall. I want to write a song about being a working mom. Like there's nobody to write those things with. So. Is it easier to write vulnerable things? Uh, I think I know the answer here, but with people that has been vulnerable with you when you're mm-hmm. writing things. And I, I kind of feel like that's, a bit of what you're saying there. If you write with Sasha and she's like pouring her guts out, then you feel safer to pour your guts out with her just on the flip side of that. Yeah, yeah. And I loved getting to do some two ways too on this. Like I have Disney World with her. It's just the two of us and Younger Woman was just me and Hillary Lindsay. And I think there's something even more intimate when it's just two people in a room. It's funny. You look at these like pop songs and there's 24 writers on them. And I'm like, could anyone really do like a big deep dive on their feelings in that room? It feels... I think the less people, and I think that around the whole project, like the less input, it was almost like the more real and the more aligned everything could, could be. I find if I'm writing jokes or I'm writing something funny and there's more three or four people in the room and only two of them laugh, I'm like, oh, it must not be right. However, that's you. usually if I'm with one person we're writing and they laugh hard, that's just it. I just know one-on-one, they were actually dialed in. They were listening. We're working together. Like, that's funny, and I shouldn't base it, because I have the same issue on a much lower level, obviously, when I'm writing things to say on stage. And I have tried to stop doing that as well, because I can't judge on two people that don't laugh. Mm-hmm. We have four people in a room. Mm-hmm. I like working with one person, and if they laugh, I just commit to it. When you're creating, will you sometimes get so deep in it that you don't know if it's good anymore? Yeah, and I don't think I was that concerned with how good it was. Okay, let me, let me take the word good back. That is a very generic word. I meant for quality. Mm. What, if I'm doing something and I stay in it a long time, I'm like, oh, this sucks. Because I can't, sometimes I'll lose it. I'll lose yeah. whatever that instinctual thing that made me go for it. I go, this isn't funny or this isn't compelling. You've done it at a high level for so long, either for others or now yourself. Do you get into that point where you, you've been in it for a while and you're like, is this even good anymore? Yeah, I th- I'm a pretty fast writer. Oh, that's good. Um, And I think that that, where I tend to start to wonder if it's good is if you get stuck on something for a long time, like there's one line or there's one part of the song that you just, it's almost, it almost feels like a helicopter where like the propeller has to just keep moving for me to, for me to keep moving forward creatively. But like once you get stuck on something for a really long time, a lot of doubt creeps in and it's almost like I just, my brain turns into knots and I can't, and that's where I lose perspective is when you just get stuck on one thing. So I'm more like, okay, let's just keep bouncing around to get this parts that we know can work. Because when I sit, there are some people that want to sit there and grind for six or seven hours on an idea. 
and that it's almost like almost feels like masochistic or something. I mean, it feels like we got to just sit there. It has to be difficult in order for it to be good. And I'm, I'm more of kind of like, let's just flow. Let's just keep it moving. Um, because when it slows down, I, I lose perspective and I'm like, uh, why are we even doing this? I'm going to play some of deathbed, which is the same three writers here. Uh, by the way, it's like a hundred degrees. Can we turn the air down a little bit? Mm-hmm. feels like it, uh, you know, we left the sauna door open. If you're all that's left of me, I'll get a good night's sleep on my deathbed. Any symbolism in it being the last track? <laughs> you think? <laughs> yes. I knew. I actually made the track list for the record um, before I wrote any of the songs. Um the you par- made the track list for the... Okay, you can't just say that and walk away from it. You wrote the track list of the record before you wrote the songs. Yeah. Okay, now please explain how you did that. So I thought about it like a book because I've been saying this is kind of like a memoir, which was the purpose was to leave my story for my kids up till now, right? And so I had the idea for Firstborn in 2020. I realized I was like, oh, 22 is my lucky number. I wonder when my birthday is on 7-22-22. And it was a Friday. And it, on that day, I was like, I'm, I'm putting out a record that day. It was as simple as that. It was so weird. But so then the idea for Firstborn came a couple months later. I screenshot it and wrote out Firstborn, Nicole Galleon, 722-22. And I texted that screenshot to like three or four people and like of my close friends, not even really in the music business. And I'm like, I'm putting out a record this day. Accountability? Accountability. And that makes it feel real to me. And even aesthetically to see it, I just made it like in a note or something. So then from there, I gave myself um, all of 2021. So I said, I'm not even going to think about it until January of 2021, and I'll have it finished by the end of 21. So when January came around, I it's almost like I had invited these ideas to kind of come to me, and I started to write down these titles. Um, I had like a bit of a creative burst, as I would say, and just started thinking of all these keywords like sunflower, um, younger woman, like things that I'm like, that's somehow tied to my life. Um, and I just kept, and then I, I compiled them and then I put them in where they would live in my life. Winter obviously being first cause I'm born in winter deathbed being last cause that's the end. Um, and filled in the blanks in the middle. And then I just kind of ruminated on them for like a month or two as I was living in my hometown in Kansas at this, at this point. So I was like going for jogs in my hometown, seeing the old houses I grew up in. And so, um, once I kind of concepted what each word, like what, what is some, what, what does sunflower mean to me? You know, what is the meaning to that? Once I did that to all the songs, then I wrote out the writers beside them as if the song was finished. Winner, McAnally, Osborne, sunflower, Robbins, Sloan. You didn't do all that. No, yeah, I did. And then I called my friends and I said, I, like I called Sasha and Jimmy first. Jimmy was always in on this from the beginning. He's been the one that was like, you, when, are, when are we starting? I don't have to produce it, but I'm helping you do this. Like, you know, and he obviously was going to always be a producer. But I called them and I'm like, I got a couple ideas. And, and then I just started texting back and forth with Sasha, like, what if Sunflower was this? And she'd hit me back, like, what if it was this? And what what if you were, you know, superpower with Sunflower? And so we had, like, skeletons of the ideas once I showed up for the right. But I have screenshots in my phone of the whole track list with all the potential, like, the writers I wanted to write it with. And it, it, it didn't end up being exactly that. I would say 80% of what the record is ended up being that way, but... I think that was also me like just being hungry for that part of the process. You know, the writing piece is like I get to write all the time, but getting to create a body of work I've never really gotten to do. So that part was, I think, the part that I was most excited about. Well, if the word Powerball comes to you and some numbers afterward, text that to me. Just <laughs> send, send that over and that'd, that'd be awesome. Uh, your hometown in Kansas, you're, uh, you know, you're very proud of it. You go, you live there for part of the year still, I'm assuming, mm-hmm. right? You know, yeah. I know you did. Um, so... When you go back, how do they treat you there? Um, Like they have no idea what I do almost. Um, And I think that's why I love it so much. Um, They know me now because we lived there for a year and a half. They know me now more as like Charlie and Ford's mom, you know, 
um, we lived there for a year and a half. And the last week that I was there, um, I was on this CMT like campfire sessions or something with Kelsey Ballerini and it was on TV and it just happened to be on a night that I was getting together with some of like all my mom girlfriends there. And so we ended up watching it and they were like, now this is so cool, but why are you on here? Not, can you explain to us why exactly she would ask you to be on here? And it was so refreshing because I had been there for a year and a half and they know I'm in the music business, but this niche thing of being a songwriter and being behind the scenes is its kind of hard to explain. And so I'm not treated any differently. I don't think you'd have to ask other people there if they think that I am or not to get the true answer. But it's almost the opposite where I think people are kind of like, no, nah, don't forget that you're just, we remember you as 16. Don't get too big for your britches. It's a, it's a weird, and I would even say if you put them beside each other, a weird juxtaposition of, I go home, same situation, but also at the same time, I don't believe there are britches big enough to hold me. <laughs> so it's like I have to not be too big for my britches at home because they will tell me, mm-hmm. and they're right. But I also, again, there are no britches that I feel like can restrain me in any way. And sometimes I miss. You know, I'm a little wrong sometimes on both sides. Uh, but it's coming from a small town like you did. It is definitely... When I go back to Mountain Pine or Hot Springs, it's definitely that. It's a reset almost and a reminder of don't forget. Now, you can dream as big as you want, but don't forget where you came from. Yeah. Your hometown has how many people? 2,000. And what kind of – you went to school. Was your, was that, was your school in your town? Yeah. And what, how big was the school? I graduated with 38 in my grade. That's pretty small. Pretty small. Yeah. yeah. I think you say reset. I think what it brings me is perspective. You know, and I, um, no one's actively trying to bring me down, but I think what it is when I sit on my porch there and I watch my neighbors mowing their yard or the kids, right? I'm like, they don't give a crap about the music business. And it, it it allows me to get out of the bubble of it and to go, don't take it all that seriously. We all get all up in this business of music and we think that it's the whole world. There's when you go back there, it's like, nobody cares, you know? And I think they love the music when it comes through the radio speakers and what the music means in their life, but all this ego stuff that happens behind, you know, and the conflict and like the who got what in Nashville, it just, I call BS on all of it when I go home. And that's, it's really refreshing. And for me, it's a reminder of what like real life folks do. Mm. Not the dumb crap that I do all the time, which I'm like, I, cause you, I can, I'm in a room five hours a day for five days a week. And then I'm usually on a plane going to do a TV show or do some comedy. And I don't, Unless I'm purposefully going back into the real world, I don't ever get to it. Not because I don't want to, because I just stretch myself so freaking thin. The great thing about being married is she makes me do that. Yeah. And not in a way of like, you must, but we spent four days in Oklahoma with our family Mm -hmm. who were great. But that's a, it's just, it's a whole different world and one that I'm so grateful that I have because we're just in a small town in Oklahoma. Yes. Going to the lake, cooking dinner, going to Chili's. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's, just it and and again it just for me is uh it takes me a little bit of, uh, a little bit out of my myopic vision of just what i only see for me and for what we're doing here mm-hmm. but i think that's so refreshing about just what you do generally and even not even just this project but what you promote uh almost universally which is that it's just going back to kansas mm-hmm. and that can be a metaphor for anything and you know everywhere but and that's represented pretty well inside of this record too and I'm assuming that was a very important to you yeah I am um, it's funny I think people would have probably guessed the over under on how many hometown songs would have been on here but because I'm like notorious for overwriting about how much I love my hometown but there aren't really any hometown songs on the record but that town made me well I would say the so, ideas behind some of the things that you're that some of the songs are about were created in a town like yours. Yeah, yeah. That I was made in that town. Right. So if you write about how I was, how I came to be, you're indirectly writing about Sterling, Kansas. And I think to your point, I love like when you were saying Chili's Lake Cookout. I'm like, oh yes, it's like a drug to me. Like oh normal, normal. But even more than that, it's like as you and you know this better than anyone in town. The more successful you have, the more it starts to revolve around you. And 
it's nice to go somewhere where it doesn't revolve around you. And I'm sure to some people that sounds like really attractive to have things revolve around you, but it's nice. And it's like, nobody, nobody cares what my schedule is. Their whole, they have a whole world that operates without me in Sterling, Kansas. That town is doing just fine without me being there. So it's nice to go and kind of get humbled in that way. Yeah. It's funny you say that I was doing an interview with some, I was doing press for my snake in the grass show and they were asking about my wife and it's funny what you, what you just said. What I was like, you know, I used to think I was the son. Just because I've been the son for so long, either I'm grinding it out, trying to feel like I'm a son, or once you get to a point, everything just starts or go, it's all, it's orbiting you. Mm-hmm. All the things. And I said, but now that I have a wife and her family, and I said, I'm just a comet. I'm not even a freaking planet anymore. <laughs> and that's awesome. It's a, it's a, a different pressure. Mm. It, it's a lesser pressure in ways, but it's a more pressure in other ways that I'm not good at. The hum- being a human is tough for me. Mm. Like, I think I was very human for a whole long time, and then I just kind of checked out. I was like, I don't want to be human anymore. This sucks. This this is uh, this hurts. So and, what'd you turn into if you weren't a human? A uh, cyborg that just works all the time and has no room for anything at all, ever. And so, but now that human is starting to, like, crack out of it again. <laughs> just, like, coming out. But I think that's what your your music is, too. It's like, it's so human and you're so specific, like I think that's what makes the project. Obviously, the, the, when you double meaning words and you have, you know, your pre-core, all of the technical stuff, you're great at. You've done that so many times. But it's how distinctly specific you are that allows people to feel and understand in their own specific way, which is weird because they can have, you can say something really specific and somebody else relates in a super specific way that's not exactly your way, but they mm-hmm. still find a relation to it. Yeah. So I think that's really the power of the project. Well, that's just my opinion. Why do I? Everybody's gonna have an opinion and feel differently about it. But I feel like it's so human, and it's so, at times. What would, the, what would be the word I would use for this? Because, if I'm being extremely vulnerable, it's not all. It's my best, but it's not always my prettiest representation because it's real. Mm. And I think some of your songs are so real. That you had to go, all right, I'm going to uh, check out of being cool Nicole who runs a label. I got to be the person that's got a lot of insecurities here. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, it was therapy doing it. I think it, you know, people probably sound like it's some PR soundbite for me, for me to be like, no, I did this for me and my family. I mean, I really did. I, it wasn't, I, I really, there was no performance element to it because I don't really, I think, I don't really know how to perform. Have you been practicing performing? <laughs> I mean, you've played song. I mean, you, you've sang publicly, mm-hmm. so I don't want to say it, but have, you know, eventually you'll probably have to do so. Well, mm-hmm. that being said, let me just say, I didn't even think about this. I called you a few days ago and I was like, hey, I'm going to go host a Today Show for a few <laughs> days, which I haven't even announced yet, but if this beats it, I don't care. And I said, hey, they asked me, like, who do you want? Do you bring anybody up here to play the show? And I, I just made sure you were available. And I said, I gave them your name first. So they could probably call you. I don't know if they're going to call you. But I said that because I was also scared they were going to be like, We've decided to go all rap. We're going to do all polka. <laughs> but they said, who do you want? And I, I very first said you. And so then I was like, oh, crap, let me make sure she can do it. But then you, I, I, I may be wrong, but then you said, I haven't really, I haven't performed on TV. Have you performed on TV? Well. As I've, yourself. No, not really. Mm-mm. No. And I'm, every time I do something for the first time around this project, it ends up being, better than I ever thought that it could be. So now I'm almost just like looking for that next first to, you know, I'm like, Ooh. So when you called me, first of all, I was like, I was in, I was at a co-write and I went into the bathroom and I was like, Oh my gosh. Like trying to like play my, like play it cool. Cause I like, I saw your text in the co-write. Um, I was right. I forget who I was with like Jimmy Robbins, somebody. And I was like, don't be a jerk. And like, I immediately just wanted to like call my mom and be like, even if I don't get on there, can you believe Bobby <laughs> Bones thought of me? <laughs> but I was in a right and I couldn't. So I just went to the bathroom and then messaged you back. And I, um, I've i always said that the Today Show was like a dream, like a bucket list thing. I just never knew what vehicle would get me there. You know, I didn't know if I would get there as a songwriter or as a label. Per- you know, I've always wanted to write a book. I was like, maybe that's how I'll get on the Today Show. Having no idea that, I mean, I've never told you that, obviously. And so that just felt... It's just constant affirmation um, 
from true friends that keep coming coming through on this project and saying, how can I help? And that's what you said. And at the end of your message is like, how can I help you? You know, and I hope this helps. So thank you. And, and it's not. And, and listen, I think you're awesome. And whatever you ever needed in like personal real life, it doesn't matter. Like, here you go. But I wouldn't vouch for it also if it wasn't great. Like, that's the second layer of that in that I could be like, hey, come to the podcast. You know, we got, uh, you know, a million people a month that will listen to this. I could do that to somebody that sucked and be like, come on. But me going, hey, you, I'm going on to do this. You should come and do this nationally. And I'm going to say I invited you up to play because I think you're so good. Like, that's one of those things that I hope you see as that's not me and you being friends. That's me going like, I believe in you, the artist and the as the performer and the creative that you are. So that's a different. That's a, no. I feel that because I've never felt you endorse something that you didn't stand behind. So that's I think maybe where the weight of that call or that message really came from. I was like, he didn't have to, you know. Like pressure is awesome. <laughs> it yeah. is. It's awesome. It's, I'm. I. I am. That word curious. I think that's the thing. I'm like, we don't know what could happen if I play on, played on the Today Show because I've never done it. Who knows who the the reach. Who knows who could be affected by my record if I got a, a bigger platform, you know? And so I'm, yeah, I think, I think I'm learning right now that there's a lot of people that after being in Nashville for 20 years are, um, are really showing up for me out of friendship, but also passion for the project. And it's like, it's making me, my mind get bigger and dream bigger, um, so maybe I will be touring this next year. I don't know. You know, it's just kind of one day at a time. Whenever, because again, they said, hey, I was just going to do one day at first. Then we're like, hey, come up. You can bring somebody. And then it turned from one day into, oh, look, we'll have you do two. Well, now it's going to be, because the Monday is like a holiday, but I'm going to do Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I'm going to do three days on there. And so then they came and said, do two days. I didn't think much about it. And I was like, they were like, who else would you want? I was like, uh, I'm a big fan of this girl named Tierra. Why don't you hit her up? I don't even think that's the, you guys, I know that she is on your label, but I love her anyway, regardless of you. And I had her open shows, you know, for yeah. me. But then once they were like, yeah, she's in. I was like, oh, I'm just feeding the whole uh, Nicole Gallia monster here. It's the <laughs> no, I know. I, um, yes. Um, that wasn't purposeful. That's the thing. Well, and I didn't think, I didn't think that it was. I was just like, wow, you know, cause you know, you like, there's a lot of things in this business that you quietly lay the groundwork for, for years and years and years invisibly and nobody sees them. And then, you, you hope that in three to five years, some of this stuff will start to like, the dots will connect on their own. And this is an example of that. It's like, you know, I signed Tierra to a publishing deal to a couple years ago. And a couple years ago, I started dreaming about making a record, having no idea that in one week, we could potentially be performing as, you know, on the Today Show. Um, and it, I've been joking that it's going to be a Songs and Daughters takeover potentially, which is so fun. That's pretty cool. Uh, so you've got the record. Are you still writing, though, now for other folks? You are? You're yeah. still? Really? I am. I wrote four songs last week. Um, I've been gone to Kansas this whole summer throughout the whole le rollout of the record because I always go to Kansas. Um, and so I just got back, started writing full time. My calendar's booked <laughs> as if nothing else is going on, um, as if this record is, like, not real. But... I told some people on my team last week, I was like, we take this one week at a time. You know, um, I have no reason to start canceling things yet. But if I go play the Today Show, I'm sorry, I'm going to go to New York, you know, and um, and those things, I'm giving myself permission to change my mind. We'll see. We'll see where I am. Every <laughs> if you'd have told me a week ago I was playing the Today Show, I wouldn't have believed you. So I'm kind of like, hmm, we'll see where we are in October and November and in the spring. But I'm writing four songs this week. Um, you know, they're all connected. You know, it's good to, it's also good to get out of my orbit. I've been thinking about myself and this record more than I'm used to. So it's nice to go in and, and write with other people. With that said, I think I can't unknow how much fun writing for me has become and how meaningful it is. And it's a little bit, I've no, I noticed last week coming back to writing it felt a little, uh, I don't know what what a fair word would be. It didn't quite feel as meaningful to just write a song to sell some beer. Did it feel like it was 
inside of a formula you've done so many times you just kind of hop back into it yeah i was writing with a couple guys um and they didn't do anything wrong they're guys i've written with for years but they said they literally said that line of well we were throwing out ideas and they're like well i mean what's gonna sell some beer guys you know and i was like wow i have not i've been in that headspace for a lot of years but i've not been in that headspace for the last couple months so it was kind of like a rude awakening of oh yeah back to the day job of trying to get on the radio again you know and that's not what this record that's not where my head was with making the record did you or when you go to the doctor or anywhere that's like occupation what do you put now um i put songwriter first i mean probably out of habit because that's where all things go back to that i've um this conversation has come up a little bit in the last year or two and what feels what what feels like I'm moving toward is more of like a creative CEO, I think. And I don't, that sounds pretentious, but it actually feels, it's uncomfortable for me to say out loud and to own that. But I, I think if you, on paper, if you wrote down all the things I was doing, it might be a fact that even as a songwriter, I'm a creative CEO, you know, in my making this project, I was definitely CEO of everything. Cause I was basically independent, like an indie artist making this. So as an indie artist would tell you, like you are the CEO of the project. So I think that's probably, that's not what I put down at the doctor, but <laughs> <laughs> it may be soon enough. Maybe. Yeah. See, yeah. Uh, when you, uh, I've been asking this forever, but maybe a year ago, maybe two years ago, you were at Kansan of the year. <laughs> oh my God. What a memory. Yeah. What do you get for that? <laughs> and I've been waiting to talk to you about that. So what happens? How do they let you know? Uh, what, what, what's the deal? <laughs> oh my gosh. This is so funny. Um, you get a really weird experience at a banquet in a conference room in Topeka, Kansas. That's what you get. Um, it's very political. Um, it's it's the organization that picks Kansan of the Year is very politics based. So that whole room was a lot of white haired guys, um, and then me. And I was actually this makes it even funnier. I was co Kansan of the Year <laughs> with a guy that had done phenomenal work in politics for like the state education department. And he was like 70 years old and every person that's in like the government in Kansas was there. The, the governor of like made a speech and they had this like beautifully put together like package for him. The governor spoke and then they're like, and now Nicole Gallion songwriter. And everyone's like, you know, that's not a creative group of people necessarily. Right. <laughs> and I'm what, 35 at the time. Or, and they're like looking at me and I made this like one of my cool little Instagram ish videos. It was like a bit of a highlight reel, very different vibe <laughs> than what the state department put together for this other man. And it was very awkward. Everyone just kind of stared at me. And to be honest, I kind of wanted the night to just be over. I was like, this is not what I thought it was going to be. Um, but it sure looks good on Wikipedia, you know? I agree. <laughs> Look cool when I saw it. I was like, that's awesome. Hands into the year. We just redid some of my bio stuff. And um, my manager, Olivia, was like, so do you want to keep cans in? Of the I was like, you watch your mouth. I'll keep cans in the year over anything else for the rest of my life. Yeah, the night doesn't have to be awesome for the award to always last and be awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, I want to play a couple more clips. We played a couple in the very, very intro before we started talking, but I do want to give self-care because if I'm, I'm just going from memory, if I'm wrong, just slap me. Uh, were you like, did you have like stuff on your face or in a shower? <laughs> right. Am I right about the imagery? Yes. Okay. I was in a bathroom. Okay. That's what it was. With like wet hair, no makeup. I had like a face mask on for part of the video. Okay. But that's how good uh, when I say what you did visually I see 10 million things a day that people are like, this, that, ah, ah, pick song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, It's just, but I can remember, I remember that. And I could, I'm going to be wrong here, but I'm colorblind as crap. What color was the tile? Was like it like blue? Pistachio green kind um, of. Well, blues and greens are very similar to me. Yes. So, are uh, you colorblind? Yes, yeah, severely. So is my husband. Really? Yeah. It's, yeah, I'm lucky that he what to, can what, match his clothes. Can he match his clothes? He's like brown, he's darker tones, like browns, greens, navies, all kind of turn into each other. Anything over like a certain threshold of dark all looks black to me. Mm. So very, so very similar, mm. very similar. Here is self care. You 
mention, Rodney, there is a song with just you two guys. I know, the first one we've ever written. I was going to say I was surprised to see. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can't write a record for my kids about my life story and then not write a song with their dad, you know? Um, We waited as the last song for the record, um, and I think it was... It was daunting to write just because I had I had that title five year plan written down in the track list with just Rodney's name next to it for months and months. But we just never could find time at our house. Like I don't know if you know if you're this way or not, but like when you come home, you you're, we you don't try have kids, to be though. home. We don't have kids though, to be fair. Yeah, that's true. And um, so we, um, like I said, I gave myself the deadline to have the record done the end of 2021, and December came, like first of December, and I'm like, the record's basically done, but I still have not written this song with Rodney because we just couldn't find time. So we were going to a Morgan Wallen show, like December, like fifth or sixth, and we were looking at hotel rooms, and I was like, why don't we just try to write this song while we're in this hotel room at the show? And he, as I was looking at this, like, you know, Hampton Inn, I'm like, I don't think we're gonna write this super meaningful song in a hotel room at the Hampton and it just doesn't look inspiring. So we got a tour bus and we're both used to as songwriters going out on the road and doing weekend runs to write for artists while they were on tour. So I was like, let's just get a bus. And we're saying we're not coming back to Nashville until we have our song written. And so we ended up writing it. It fell out really fast in a couple hours. And, um, and that's kind of like part of the lyric at the end of the song it says like, I'm backstage at a show and here we are, and this life is so much better than anything I would have planned. So that was, we squeaked that one in at the end, but I I think that kind of opened Pandora's box again for me of how much I loved writing with him. Really? We have not written together. I mean, we didn't write together the first 10 years we were married because he just knew I was fiercely independent and didn't want his career to overshadow mine, which was so loving and wise. But then once I started to have success, we wrote together a little bit with other people, for other people. But we had never done this thing where it's like, you're the only person that knows I drove a Maxima in 2003. And you're the only person that could put that in this song. So um, I think there's more where that came from, for sure. Here is Five Year Plan. Boxes I was checking, goals that I was setting out. All of a sudden, I got a ring on my finger. Think being the singer just got knocked off the top of my list. Cause baby, love don't fit in a five year plan. So, I'm gonna ask you this, and I would only ask you this because you wrote about it publicly. It's not about your project, but I remember looking on Instagram one day and you had written that the Beers on Me song sounded a bit like something you had written. <laughs> I did not say anything about any specific song. Yeah, yeah. True. Mm-hmm. But I mean, everybody kind of knew because it, it sounded very similar. So what what motivated you to write that in a land of everybody just goes, well, there's only so many chords. There's only so many notes you can do. Mm-hmm. Because you're now a writer on the song, right? And did that get contentious at all? Um, yeah, it was complicated, um, for sure. Um, I think you ask about motive or, like, what, you know, why. I think I've noticed in Nashville, and it wasn't just about that song, but it was a bigger picture where there is a gray area in rooms. You know, you're right, there are so many, only so many notes. But in the 15 years of me having a publishing deal, what feels like writing on top of something else has gotten way more loose than it used to be. Um, and I think I think I felt like some good could come out of just shining a light on, on that because I've had so many writers come up to me after and say, man, you know, now you got us all thinking like the next week we were we were like about to finish our song and we thought maybe it sounded like too much like this other song. So we pulled the other song up and we listened to it. And um, and I'm like, yeah, I think that's really where my heart was, was like, I think we've inched our way a little too far into the gray zone. Um, and I think everyone um, is capable, myself being first of, you know, writing on top of other things. I think um, I think I just I think awareness was just really all that I 
I wanted out of that. There were a couple people that had mentioned something to me. They were just happy you did it because everybody kept talking about doing it and everybody knew it was happening and nobody would do it. And they were just like, we just need somebody to kind of be a leader and go for it. And it didn't have to be this sense. It, it could have been a thousand different, mm-hmm. as you said, because it's, it's happening everywhere. Well, that's why there were no song titles involved. It was more about, I just want our community to just kind of like look in the mirror and say like, are we being, are we having integrity? You know, and that's just, that's between me and myself and you and yourself and the next writer and themselves themselves. And I, um, and I think you're right. You, you just reminded me of last year when this went down. I feel like the more success you have and the more privilege you have in, in whatever position you're in, it comes with responsibility. And I see why, you know, I see why you need somebody that's in my position who's not worried, if I'm being completely honest, about my kid's college being paid for anymore. I think if I was in the beginning of my career... And I see this happen a lot. I know a lot of I know a lot of situations in our industry where somebody feels like they want to speak up, but then they're afraid to become the villain of a situation that and and they don't want to hurt their their livelihood. You know, everyone's just trying to keep their lights on. And being a songwriter is tough, top to bottom, no matter who you are. But it's you know. I had less to lose, and I felt like that's what leadership is, is if you can stick your neck out there and be honest and be true, um, then the people that look up to me are more likely to be honest and true when they become me. And that's, you know, while that was a complicated situation, I felt, I felt like I was me in that situation, and I felt peace about I felt more peace after I had shared and, sh- and sh- you know, shown a light on it. So it, um, one of the weirder things in my career so far, but, um, but, you know, I think everything that's happened in my career has happened for me. And I think that that happened for me. I learned a lot about myself through that. What I, and again, I saw it, but what I took from it and we'll move off this and be done with it. But what I took from it was, I remember going, well, she doesn't, she definitely doesn't have to do this. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like you had no success and you're screaming that someone ripped a song off of you so you could get on a, on a right. Mm-hmm. Like you, it wasn't going to change your life at all. I mean, really, mm-hmm. very, very little yet. And you knew probably what the possibilities of blowback were going to be. I know what the possibilities of, in this town mm-hmm. where, I mean, I say stuff all the time and then I get blackballed in certain areas until I'm just not anymore. It's just a weird, weird place that we're in. And I remember thinking, all right. She's not going to gain a lot from this. Um, she's not doing it because of that. Let's see where this goes. So I, I thought it was a, I thought it was a brave and bold thing to do. Oh, thank you. And uh, I think other people have felt the same. I, my reputation with myself is more important than my reputation with others. And I felt like I was, I liked, I liked that version of me, you know. Yeah, my reputation with myself is just still a weenie. <laughs> and it's, it's with others too so what do you know it's all in common um okay well look i i don't know what to say like you it's just you're inspiring in many ways um i don't know it's just just what do you say just accept, keep on because a lot of people are seeing what you're doing and going oh that can be done and i think that's probably in my mind the biggest compliment i could give you is that you're allowing other people to see what can actually be done and that the world is bendable Mm -hmm. and so don't freaking stop it's inspiring to me you know it's awesome um i'll end on this did your daughter like hamilton oh my gosh she's obsessed i think i have a little thespian on my hands really yeah i was never in musicals i was i would play piano kind of in the pit for the musicals but she's obsessed and it was so fun whenever i saw you guys i saw your instagram she was on the program and I thought, they went to New York. But it's here, huh? It was here? Yeah, it was here in Nashville yesterday. I didn't know. I watched it in New York. And I go in. I don't Lucky. Know, I don't, well, no, well, hold on. Wait till you hear the story. <laughs> I'm by myself. I'm up there doing some work. And my agent was like, hey, I'll go, go to Hamilton. And I was like, all right. I'm by myself. I'll go. I didn't know anything about it. It was way early. I didn't know how lucky I was to get tickets way early. I think it was before the phenomenon mm. started to exist. And so I go. And a lot of people there. But I go. And I'm sitting down. And I'm like. And they start the show, and they're like, and I'm like, all right, I can't really keep up, but they'll start talking soon enough, so I'm just going to lay back and relax until they talk and I can catch up. They never talked. They just rapped the whole show. It took about half the show for me to go, oh, I got to pay attention because they're never stopping rapping. Mm. So I sat through half of it just going, okay, eventually they'll catch me up with their words. But then once I was able to, like, sit in it and just go, 
Then my mind was blown. My mind was blown. I wish I would have known. I'm such a don't see a spoiler guy that I won't. I don't even know it was all hip hop the whole time. Yeah. I wish I would have looked. But then I go, what if it had been spoiled? But then I go, that's history, you idiot. You could have read it in a book in eighth grade. So it really wasn't a spoiler. It's just history. But that's cool that she likes it. Yeah, I've, um, she's so obsessed with the songs I've heard all. I mean, I've watched it with her, like on Disney Plus or something. I don't know what it's yeah. on, but I've watched it once or twice, but listen to this. I've had to hear the songs a million times. And even still, yesterday when I saw it, I was like, I catch something different. It, there's so many words and it's so brilliant the way there's like these through lines of how they keep coming back to the mm-hmm. same melodies and, and songs throughout the whole thing. I mean, it's just, it's on another level. I was in awe. Well, Nicole, we've said it all. I, what do you I do now? Have... Do you go and like work on some sort of atomic reactor over at the, some, <laughs> I don't know. Like, what do you do now? The rest right of the day? now I'm yeah. actually going to meet, um, my manager, Olivia and, uh, Cheese Gal. You know Cheese Gal? I did. She, Courtney LaCourt? Yeah, she did cheese for us. Yeah, she's incredible. Times, yeah. We um we may have a little something up our sleeve. We're going to go meet and have a little powwow. A song about cheese? I'm into it. That's the kind of music I need. More songs about <laughs> cheese. All right, you guys follow Nicole. Uh, Nick at Night Music, but N-I-C and N-I-T-E. I mean, that's... I, no, if this becomes a thing, you got to get a... You can have know. to switch your name to something people can just say easily. And I not know. have to explain it. Because if I, I were to just go Nick at Night Music, they wouldn't find it. But if I, I go, and I, then I complain for 30 seconds, and it's taking us three minutes just to go follow. That's how you know who your true fans are, if they'll, if they'll do a deep dive. That's true. And then they tell you, you got to change it. <laughs> All right, you guys follow Nicole. We put up her name up, up in this as well. And congratulations. Thank you for having me. And I'll see you in a few years. But we'll, no, I'll see you in a few weeks on today's I show. I hope so. Yeah, I'll see you in today's show in a few weeks. All right, bye. Bye. bye.